Eagles Entertainment. With the 10th pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select... You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy. We're continuing our recap of the 2021 NFL Draft, looking at the NFC and AFC East. And we're going to start that off with Draft Buzz, where I catch up with Ben Fennell and Dane Brewer to discuss the remaining three teams in the NFC East, the Dallas Cowboys, the New York Giants, and the Washington football team. And we also take a look at three of the AFC East teams with those guys as well, with the New York Jets, the Buffalo Bills, and the Miami Dolphins. The main goal of these conversations, not to give out draft grades and who won the draft, who the, the steals and the reaches, but it's more to talk about team building philosophy of these teams, finding out their types, getting into the whys behind certain selections, and really just kind of put this class to bed here for 2021. And we're going to continue that conversation with the remaining AFC East team, the New England Patriots, in our Blueprint segment, where I catch up with Mark Schofield and and discuss this Patriots team and their draft class here in 2021. Not only is Mark one of the best resources in the media when it comes down to breaking down the intricacies of quarterback play, but he's also someone who follows this Patriots team very, very closely. So we'll dig into the nitty-gritty of their team-building strategies and some of the things that showed up in this year's draft. Then we're going to wrap things up with our draft mailbag. We've got a great question uh, or two from you uh, at home to wrap up today's show. As always, rate, review, subscribe. I always say it. It's the best way to help us out. Go on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. If you don't already subscribe, make sure you hit that subscribe button and then just throw us a rating, throw us a comment. Appreciate everybody that has done that. If you are a fan of one of the teams that we're breaking down in the show and you're not subscribed yet, I promise this is not the only time that we talk about your team and this is not an Eagles only podcast. We cover every team all year round discussing prospects, uh, team fits, team building philosophies like we are today. uh, And we do it throughout the calendar year. So be sure to hit subscribe, take the ride with us all the way up to the 2022 NFL draft. We're going to start breaking down these prospects here in the next few weeks. That being said, uh, let's get this show going. We're going to kick things off with Dane and Ben in draft buzz. Now it's time for draft buzz. All right. Well, as I mentioned, excited to get things going here as I welcome in uh, Ben and Dane. Guys, uh, it's the first time in a couple of weeks that the three of us have been together really since day three of the draft. But uh, we spent some time uh, obviously breaking down all of the Eagle selections. So now I want to kind of turn around to look at the, the rest of the league. And we're going to start here in the NFC East and with the AFC East here today. We'll start with the Dallas Cowboys, Dana, a team that you know well. Obviously, you were down at the Star uh, for draft weekend. For the for the listeners, I'll just kind of run through the picks really quickly, and we'll do that for every single team. Uh, and then we'll just kind of get into a couple of superlatives and just talk about how the team went about building their draft class. You get Michael Parsons here at number one. Uh, round two, you get Kelvin Joseph. Round three, Osa Odigizua and Chauncey Golson, along with Nashawn Wright, uh, to round out the third round. Day three, bunch of picks here. Linebacker Jabril Cox from LSU. Tackle Josh Ball from Marshall. Wide receiver Simi Fahoko from Stanford. Defensive tackle Quinton Bohanna from Kentucky. Israel Mukuamu, the defensive back from South Carolina. And then Nebraska guard Matt Farniak to round out the draft in the seventh round. So, guys, talking about this Dallas Cowboys team, uh, let's just talk about the first pick. We'll talk about Micah Parsons. And, Dane, we'll come to you first. Why was he the selection? Obviously, it seems like reports point to the fact that you know Dallas wanted a corner there, uh, and then obviously both corners go uh, eight and nine just before they select a ten. They trade out with the Eagles, allowing the Eagles move up to Devontae Smith. Why was Micah Parsons the choice uh, in your mind? Well, I mean, yeah, you set it up. It's pretty simple. They got wiped out of corner. Uh, they were sitting at ten, knowing there was a chance that either J.C. Horn or Patrick Sertan or both could be gone. And that was really an ongoing debate in their war room, uh, which corner they liked more. Coaches wanted J.C. Horn. The scouts wanted Sertan. And that that's what the, they were talking about the weeks leading up to draft day, uh, knowing that there was an outside chance that both could be off the board. Uh, and, you know, it turns out it, it didn't really matter which one they were going to go with because uh, they went eight, nine. So that led to the Cowboys trading back with the Eagles a few spots. And at that at that point, I mean, they knew the Eagles were coming up for Devontae Smith and they liked Rashawn Slater and Micah Parsons, knowing one of them would be there at pick 12. And in the end, they preferred defense because they know, I mean, watching Dallas's defense last year was a train wreck, uh, especially at linebacker. The Cowboys said Parsons was their highest graded defensive prospect on the board, uh, which I think is a little bit of a spin because, you know, we knew they were taking a corner at 10, but regardless, they do love Parsons. They love the fit in Dan Quinn's scheme on paper. It's very similar to Bruce Irvin. And I think we're going to see Parsons line up as that Sam. He's going to rush. He's going to drop. Uh, he's going to be doing quite a bit and pretty early. I think we're going to see him contribute in a big way 
uh, as a rookie this year. Ben, there's been uh, you know some scuttlebutt about what that front is going to look like. Michael Parsons went on a uh, friend of the podcast, Ross Tucker. He went on his show last week and talked about, oh, you know, there, it's going to be a three-four base, and uh, you know, this is I'm going to be rushing the quarterback. At the end of the day, kind of speaking to what Dane said, uh, his versatile skill set is going to serve that front well. I'm I'm really interested to see how he's used and ultimately deployed once he uh, you know he lines up. Uh, whether it's on third down, how is he going to be getting after the quarterback? Where is he going to be lining up? Uh, it will be fun to be able to see that early on. Yeah, you're definitely adding an exciting, explosive playmaker to the defense, whether at Mike Will or maybe uh, playing down on the line of scrimmage as a Sam linebacker or a rush end on third down. I think he could wear a lot of different hats for you. And this is very quietly going to be like a two-year rebuild of this entire defense. So I think adding a player like Michael Parsons is certainly a cornerstone and a great foundational piece to kind of move forward. And there's a lot of other picks we'll dive into on the defensive side of the ball that I think are going to be mainstays for a number of years. And they're going to have a big kind of transition from the previous era. And it's like guys like Sean Lee retiring and maybe some uh, young influx of talent that they won't be extending that second contract to, like maybe a Leighton Vander Esch that they have to figure out what they want to do under new defensive coordinator, Dan Quinn coming in. So he's bringing in Keanu Neal, a couple new free agents and a lot of defensive players in this past draft. I think when you look even over just the last handful of years, like since Will McClay uh, has really kind of taken hold of the draft with Dallas, you know, the, their first round picks, a lot of shared qualities, a lot of themes that really kind of pop up. All of these first round picks have been underclassmen. They've all been 21 or 22 years old. They've all been really known as kind of physical, tough football players. That's really kind of the the hallmark of what they're looking for. Uh, and I think Parsons checks a lot of those boxes. Certainly the athletic measurables as well uh, kind of caters towards what they look for early in the draft. So guys, uh, I went through all of the picks that we've seen so far from this Dallas Cowboys team. Uh, let's just kind of go through outside of the Parks, Parsons selection which one of their picks was our favorite? They like just kind of said like, you know, that really kind of stood out to us. Ben, uh, I'll come to you first. Which, which of the Cowboys picks really kind of stood out to you as making a lot of sense for that team? Well, I thought it was the run on defensive linemen, particularly in the third round there. You know, I'll let you touch on Chauncey Golson, but also Digizua from North Carolina and his versatility, ability to play up and down the defensive line from one tech, three tech, standing up, maybe five tech off the edge as well, adding certainly an athletic explosive element to the trenches and a lot of versatility which this entire defensive line, you know, potentially need to be overhauled. So to grab Osa Odigizua and then Chauncey Golson, and then going the other way with like a Quentin Bohana later on, a 350 mm. pound nose tackle to kind of complement the skill sets in there. Really interesting kind of mix of players up there. But like you were saying before, a lot of tough players, a yep. lot of really good football players, not a lot of finesse players. And I think the Cowboys, not just their front seven, but their defense collectively, uh, there's going to be a lot of competitions and a lot of new bodies because last year they were, they had some historic bads and they, uh, they know they need to improve that. I think when you look at the, you know, just the, the Dan Quinn schemes of the past and you talk about all oh, like, you know, what does it look like in Seattle? If you use that as the template, you know, you look at Oso Diggy Zua, you look at Chauncey Golson, you might, you're right. I wanted to talk about Golson. You know, do, are they like the red Bryant and Michael Bennett, uh, versions So you know, is Osa more of like the Michael Bennett role, uh, in terms of kind of being that open side three technique. And then if you look at, uh, at Chauncey Golson, is he going to be that strong side, almost like a five technique, uh, defensive lineman for them? Uh, I really am interested to see ultimately how all of those defensive fr front players are used. But, uh, I think Golson, I mean, his ability to win inside, win outside, I think that certainly uh, makes it a really interesting pick and Golson really kind of fit with that multiple skill set. I mean, for if you are a defensive coordinator that wants to be multiple, he really, really fits. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Dane, what was yours? I have to go with Jabril Cox here, um, the linebacker out of LSU in the fourth round. I still have not received a good answer as to why he fell to the fourth round. I was told, you know, there wasn't anything serious medically, anything like that. Um, it, it, you know, it's just at, at that point in the draft, in the fourth round, day three, it's an absolute steal. And I mean, I was told that the Cowboys had a higher grade on Cox than any of their third round picks. Uh, and so if they don't, if they draft a uh, corner, Sertana Horn in the first round, they're taking Cox with that first third round pick. Uh, and so just an interesting ripple effect that, you know, because they took Parsons in the first, they did not want to double up on linebacker that early. And, but at the, and they considered him at 99. And in the end, they took Nashawn Wright. But then uh, you get to the fourth round, it's just like, okay, you know, we just can't pass again. Uh, and so they get to Cox at that point. You know, obviously there are some concerns about, concerns about his run fits 
but an excellent space athlete. Uh, you know, he, he needs to be more consistent at the line of scrimmage, but when dropping in space, that's, that's where his, uh, strengths uh, as a player really show. And, and, you know, you see the versatility. And so really with those two picks with Parsons and then Jabril Cox, they totally remade, uh, you know, the look, the outlook and future of that linebacker depth chart, uh, which, you know, they were not happy with going into the draft. Guys, one thing to do before we wrap up each of these teams, just kind of go over the top here. Any takeaways from their approach to the draft and, and what it says about their team moving forward? Again, kind of talking big picture team building philosophy. And I think, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but there's a there's an identity. You can kind of see a theme that kind of recurs when you look at the way that they address the first round of the draft. You know, the young players, highly athletic, known for physicality and toughness. I think what's interesting about Dallas, you can all there's always there's not a lot of secrets with them during the pre-draft process. Right. We kind of have an idea. Who are, who are the players? What are the positions? What are they going to try? They're going to go in. They're going to attack the draft. They're, here are the positions we're going to hit. Here are the guy, the t- types of players uh, that we are going to typically go for. We're not afraid of red flags, whether it's medical red flag or character red flag. And, and everybody's un- under that umbrella, whoever fits. You can kind of pencil those guys in for um, potentially having a blue star on their helmet. So I, to me, when as someone who kind of tracks us from the outside, it's fun having teams like that because you can kind of, you know, really kind of uh, predict who are some of the guys that end up down there in Dallas? Uh, guys, is there anything from your, from your standpoint uh, that stands out to you? Dan, I'll, I'll come to you first on that. Yeah, no, I th- and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, even a couple of years ago when they drafted, they didn't have a first round pick and they drafted Tristan Hill with their first pick in the second round. Uh, I mean, even we knew that was happening. So, I mean, they're, it's pretty transparent, which does make it nice for those of us on the outside looking in. Um, and it just, it's an interesting way that they operate. Um, I, for me, this draft cycle, obviously they went heavy defense, but the other common theme that in, in, in a draft cycle where we had less information than about these guys than any other year, the Cowboys were not shy taking chances on players that maybe there were a few question marks. You talk about uh, Michael Parsons, you talk about Kelvin Joseph in the second, and then especially Josh Ball uh, taking him uh, on day three. I mean, they were not scared of taking chances on guys that have some questions off the field. Uh, and obviously they must have gotten the answers they were looking for throughout the process and through all their research that they felt comfortable making those moves. But, uh, you know, it's something that is, you know, we'll have to look back at this in a couple of years and see if that ended up, you know, coming back to bite them or if they were, you know, uh, will they be rewarded in making some of those risk decisions with these players? That's what like coming in, we knew obviously this was going to be that year where you didn't have that info. The teams that historically have been okay with those kind of, you know, those riskier players, would they still feel as brazen and obviously Dallas uh, felt okay with making those decisions. Uh, ben, any other uh, kind of big over the top takeaways from uh, the way Dallas attacked the draft? You know, I just feel like a lot of it was kind of more of the same, you know, they had been willing to go after the kind of questionable character guys in the past, whether it's Randy Gregory, whether it's Tristan Hill last year, whether um, you know, it was going back and getting Lyle Collins, you know, a couple years earlier. And, you know, they seem to have a tight now at corner. They want the big, long press corners. They obviously grabbed two uh, pretty good ones this year. And Kelvin Joseph, uh, even Israel Mukawamu from uh, South Carolina, who they have listed at safety, obviously a massive corner. But Nashawn Wright will be a corner. But you look to last year, Trayvon Diggs, big corner. Reggie Robinson, big corner. So, obviously, they have a tight now, and that's their style Um you know, on the outside as far as defensive back. And then a lot more, you know, active athletic trench players. So I think trying to get a little bit more, uh, you know, disruptive and find some more playmakers on that defensive front is certainly uh, the name of the game for them to kind of pair with their existing players with, you know, uh, Tristan Hill and they got Carlos Watkins in free agency and uh, Demarcus Lawrence on the edge. And Ben, I'm so glad that you brought that up because, you know, we, we have these discussions year round, whether it's in our, on the clock series when we're, you know, trying to make picks for teams throughout the draft or, you know, having these conversations in like the, uh, uh, what do we call it? Under the hood, right. During the fall where we're always trying to match what teams are looking for in a position. It's not just, Oh, you know, Dallas needs a corner. Just give them the uh, Asante Samuel or uh, whatever corner uh, is on the board. Every team has types and every team, uh, you know, ha- has the prototype that they're looking for. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Clearly, uh, Dallas ha- has a type at certain positions. That's something uh, to monitor here moving forward. Let's stay in the NFC East, guys, and go to the New York Giants. And I'll just kind of quickly run through their picks. Uh, they trade down in round one. They end up with Kadarius Tony in the first round. To round out day two, they take Georgia pass rusher uh, Aziz Ojolari 
and cornerback Aaron Robinson from UCF. Three picks on day three. You got pass rusher Ellerson Smith from Northern Iowa, running back Gary Brightwell, and then corner Rodarius Williams. Uh, let's go to the top pick. And Dane, let's talk about Kadarius Toney. Um, why do you feel like he was the selection there for the Giants at, uh, I believe it was 15 overall they ended up, or no, it was uh, later. It was not, what was it? Uh, 18 20? overall, 20 overall. All right, after yeah. uh, the trade down with Chicago. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. Dave Gettleman wants to give Daniel Jones uh, every chance to succeed as yeah. this team's quarterback. Uh, last year, it was about investing in the offensive line. This year, it's about the receivers, starting with Kenny Galladay in free agency, then Tony in the first round. And I, even though he's taken some pretty large strides over the years at Florida, I mean, Tony is still more gadget than he is polished receiver. So it'd be very interesting to track his development as a rookie. And I mean, I'll be honest, I have my doubts about Jason Garrett, you know, using Tony to his full potential in that offense. I just, I'm, I'm very uh, eager to see how it plays out. And you know, it, it's, it's really interesting when you look at it, uh, it, it like, okay, I love doing what ifs, what if the Eagles don't leapfrog, the Giants. Do the Giants then stay put and take Devontae Smith at 11? And then what happens with Justin Fields and the Bears in that scenario? So uh, it's really interesting when you look back at it and just, you know, what could have been and the dominoes that that follow uh, with, with these certain trades and the moves. But it, I'm really eager to track Tony's development in that offense as they try to get Daniel Jones as much help as possible. Uh, can I just say quickly, like this draft class from the Giants, just it makes me sad because – I've said numerous times on the show that my favorite stat with the NFL draft is that Dave Gettleman in you right. know, seven years as a general manager had never traded down. He did it twice to start the draft. Uh, they yeah. came away with some good, you know, some good quality uh, picks coming out of it, obviously getting the extra picks uh, for next year as well. But uh, that trend uh, now out the window, but uh, Dave Gettleman, I mean, you get Canaries, Tony to me, I agree, uh, Dan, it's all about, uh, setting up Daniel Jones for success. Uh, ben, was there anything else? I, you, you, we've been talking about Kadarius Tony uh, on this podcast, really like since it's, it's uh, inception, it feels like, because uh, you had had eyes on him when he was a freshman uh, thoughts on, on Tony ending up in New York. Yeah. I just love his skill set to kind of compliment, you know, free agent addition and Kenny Galladay uh, obviously has a bigger presence. Sterling Shepard is a great route runner. We know Saquon Barkley is going to get force fed the ball in both phases of the game. Kadarius Tony is really that RPO yak threat. That really, really kind of pairs well and has a complementative skill set to those uh, other skill players on there. So I think John Ross and Darius Slayton will kind of compete to be the deep threat. But Tony's that guy. You just want to kind of get the ball in his hands and let him work. He might end up being a scat back type of guy. You know, he might be a guy that does a lot of his work on third down out of the backfield and just finding ways to get him the ball. And just kind of touching on Gettleman and his draft trends. I love when they break the mold. Because in my opinion, I think a lot of that is results-based analysis. Mm -hmm. I think you look at their picks and then forecast the trends and see what types of themes there were. And you don't really know how much it was involved in the process. We're not, you know, obviously in those draft rooms on the boards. It's the same thing like saying, we need a tackle. Give me the averages of all the Hall of Fame tackles. It doesn't mean there wasn't a tackle above and below that threshold. Yep. So it's the same thing with Gettleman. He's never traded out until he does. And then it's just another results-based piece to kind of put into the equation. I think some GMs, there are trends and uh, I think a little bit more substance to it, but um, I love when uh, kind of some of the decisions maybe ebb and flow uh, a direction you didn't expect. I feel like another one that was kind of broken a little bit, we'll get into our favorite picks here uh, from the Giants draft class. Obviously only six picks, which is interesting because the you figure with a trade down, you'd end up with more. Uh, they did trade up a couple of times uh, in this group. But the Giants, um, their second pick was Aziz Ojolari, the pass rusher from Georgia. And one of the things that I've noted uh, in just looking at Gettleman in the past, they typically don't take a he, I should say he, because this goes back to Carolina as well. He typically has not taken a lot of players that have medical red flags. And, and you know, the, all the reports are that Aziz Ojolari fell out of round one because of questions about the knee. And it wasn't even anything, and Dane, you could tell me if I'm wrong, my understanding of the reports were not necessarily like, oh, the, the knee is bad. It's that we're waiting on word back from the specialist that, and we don't know uh, what the deal is with the knee. And that uncertainty caused him to drop a little bit. I know that was the case with Jeremiah Usu koromoa as well, uh, going down to Cleveland. But um, Aziz Ojolari, you know, to get that kind of, if they had taken him at 11 overall, uh, where they were sitting, if you told me that five weeks ago, I'd say, yeah, like I, I definitely could see it. Um, you know, we know the ties that both Gettleman and Joe Judge have with that Georgia program. Uh, obviously, when you look at Ojolari, you know, what he has done as a, the first freshman captain uh, in Georgia history, and just uh, so many things working in his favor, how productive he was, uh, especially at such a young age in the SEC. 
so much pointing towards this making a lot of sense for New York, but they, they get them in round two. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that asking around, that that was kind of the word I got was, if you liked him enough, you're still going to draft him high. And so to see him fall out of the first round is a little bit of a surprise. But then to see him fall as far as he did in the second round was definitely uh, another surprise. So it just because I mean, each team has different tolerances when it comes to these uh, these injuries that aren't cut and dry. You know, every knee is different. Every, uh, you know, uh, diagnosis is different in terms of, you know, your crystal ball and, you know, for doctors and, you know, what, what's it going to mean in, in five years? It's really hard to forecast that. And so I'm sure different teams had different answers to that. Um, but, you know, getting Aziz Adjulier in the second round uh, feels like that risk is well worth it. Ben, who was your favorite pick uh, from this Giants group? Well, there's few teams that had a more impressive first four picks, in my opinion, to go Tony, Aaron Robinson from UCF, and to grab two starting defensive ends, in my opinion. That's right, mm-hmm. starting defensive ends and Aziz Oljolari and Ellerson Smith from Northern mm-hmm. Iowa, who I thought was one of the kind of early day three darlings of this group. They got him right there in round four. Guys weighing 250 and jumping over 30 and a half, there's four guys in this draft. I mean, Jason Owe, Milton Williams here in Philadelphia, Joseph Asai, and Ellerson Smith. He has some freaky, freaky measurables. 6'6", 252, jump 41 and a half inches, still kind of learning the whole defensive end since being an all-state tight end coming out of high school. I thought he had a great senior bowl week, a great senior bowl game. He's long, he's explosive, he's disruptive. I think the Giants and having two new kind of uh, – quarterback hunters on either side of that defensive line the NFC East better look out. I think having two really exciting players uh, is exactly what they needed. Yeah. Uh, he is uh, certainly an interesting one to keep in mind there for early day three, Ellerson Smith. Dane, uh, was there a pick that stood out to you? Was it Ojolari or was it somebody else? Well, I, I think that the Ellerson Smith picks interesting because I, 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 you know, in that scheme, I'll be interested to see how they use him exactly. Is he going to be playing off the ball a little bit? Uh, you know, off the line of scrimmage, because I, th- I think he almost needs to. I, I think what stood out with me with Smith and why I didn't love him as a player, I liked him because of the athleticism, but the lack of power really, you know, really struck me. And so uh, I'll be interested to see how they, first of all, how they look to bulk him up, how they add, tr- add strength to his game, but then how do they deploy him? Uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see how they how they use him there. And then, uh, you know, Aaron Robinson. Uh, I mean, you know, they get him in the third. Uh, I, you know, some people believed he was, some teams believed he was the best nickel in this class. Uh, so I thought they got excellent value at that point. I need to see how Ellerson handles a punch from Tyron Smith. Because right. he's a guy that's a little light in the pants, a little lean yeah. through the frame. He could get jolted and really rattled at the point of attack. And there's a few guys in the NFL with heavier hands and a grip and torque strength than Tyron Smith uh, having to battle him twice a, twice a year in the NFC East. You would argue that the biggest need that that football team had coming into the entire offseason uh, was off the edge. Those pass rushers, just that, that group in general. So uh, to get those two talents there uh, within the first four rounds, I think was big uh, for that football team. To me, just kind of looking big picture, and we'll go over the top here on the Giants. We Gettleman's talked about it. Uh, I think there's been, you know, I think it's even like a meme worthy thing amongst like football Twitter is like Gettleman's love for the senior ball. They've taken more senior ball players, and Gettleman has taken more senior ball players than pretty much anybody. And obviously, that continued here uh, with this group. I, we talked about Ellerson Smith, uh, Kadarius Tony is a senior bowl guy, um, Aaron Robinson, a senior bowl guy, Rodarius Williams, a senior bowl guy. So, six picks, four of them coming from the senior bowl. Uh, I think that's just going to be a continued trend. I think we always talk about with Dave Gettleman. Dane, was there a, any other kind of big picture approach thing that stood out to you about this Giants team? Yeah, I mean, that's a great observation about the Senior Bowl. Um, I think you know, talking to teams before the draft and just trying to figure out which, which each one of these teams are going to do, a lot of them said the same thing about uh, Gettleman. Oh, he wants a pass rusher. He wants a pass rusher. He wants a pass rusher. And, I, I th- you know, I, they almost did. I, I'm told they tried to trade up to 17 uh, with the Raiders to get Jalen Phillips, uh, who then went a pick later at 18. But the Raiders, like Leather, were that much. Um, and then they could have grabbed Quiddy Pay uh, there in the first round. Instead, they went with the pass catcher uh, because of how much he wants to help the quarterback. So now, you know, picking up a first for next year, really, this everything, the, the light is even brighter on Daniel Jones now. You know, he's on notice. No if he struggles this year, the Giants have the ammo to attack the quarterback position in a big way in, in next year's draft in the first round. So, uh, you know, the, the general manager gave the quarterback more weapons to play with in free agency and uh, in, in the draft early with premium picks. So now it's up to the quarterback to prove that he could be the guy. Ben, how about you? 
Yeah, you know, just uh, kind of continuing the same trends of Gettleman over the past, you know, especially those mid rounds, not afraid to go after kind of developmental upside guys. Yep. Not afraid of small school guys. Yep. You know, he took O'Shane Zeminis out of Old Dominion two years ago, took Lorenzo Carter in the third round, I think three or four years ago. You know, Carter was a uh, high side type of developmental guy. Same thing with Ellerson Smith, right in that same ballpark. You're betting on the traits, you're betting on the development, and uh, hopefully in two, three years, you ended up walking away with a stud. Yeah, I mean, they they clearly, I think there's a lot that's said about Gettleman as like, oh, you know, he's old school, this and that. They very much value like athleticism traits, young players. Like even though they're senior bowl heavy, they're still they're te- typically young seniors. They don't draft a lot of twenty four year olds. They're, you know, it's a it's it's an interesting kind of like uh, you know riding the fence like right down the middle path for them. But um, it, clearly, you know, trying to focus in on guys that have traits that have some upside uh, developmental players whose best football could be ahead of them. And they took a really interesting player undrafted Raymond Johnson, the third out of Georgia Southern, mm, which right. I find the undrafted is to be very interesting this year. Cause there's really only a handful or so from yes. each team. So it's yep. very focused, but another guy, developmental guy, high side traits, small school, checking all the boxes. Love that. Yep. Uh, th- those are the kind of things I love just kind of following uh, those kind of trends and um, you know, for established general managers and, and decision makers, whether it's Will McClay in Dallas or Dave Gettleman in New York, those, you know, you can kind of, those trends are there. The breadcrumbs are there. When you have a, a new organization that's really kind of taking hold, sometimes you're, you're trying to piece together and Washington was one of those teams for me this year, right? Because, you know, Ron Rivera, longtime uh, head coach, obviously. And it seems that he has got the power. He's the guy who's got the juice uh, down there with Washington, but they've got a new general manager and Martin Mayhew. Uh, they bring over Marty Herney from Carolina, who was with Rivera for so long down with the Panthers. So uh, it's kind of interesting with all of these cooks in, in this kitchen, how was it going to turn out? Now you've got to look, you look at the Washington football team, a bunch of picks here, and we'll just kind of breeze through real quick. Jameen Davis, the first round pick, linebacker out of Kentucky. Sam Cosby, the left tackle from Texas. They round out the third round with two picks. Benjamin St. Juice, the corner from Minnesota, and then Deami Brown, the wide receiver from North Carolina. Handful of selections here on day three. You've got the Boise tight end, John Bates, Cincinnati safety, Derek Forrest, uh, Cam Cheeseman, the long snapper, a couple of pass rushers here from the senior ball and William Bradley King from Baylor and Shaka Tony from Penn state. And then Dax Milne, the wide receiver from BYU. So, uh, let's bring this back to round one and talk about that first pick. Jameen Davis, uh, Dane, I'll come back to you as we, as we have here for this segment. Uh, what is the, uh, what, what, for in your mind, why was he the pick here for Ron Rivera and the Washington football team? They wanted to find their Darius Lanner, you know, an alpha in the middle of the defense. You can stay on the field in any situation, make plays. And, you know, I have some questions with Davis, but there's no doubt about his length, his athleticism, his reaction to movement. Uh, he's fantastic in zone coverage. And, you know, Washington's been no stranger to drafting front seven defenders in the first round, uh, even though, you know, that that has scaled multiple uh, different decision makers in the front office. Uh, but they do it again here with a high traits linebacker. And so uh, I, I think, you know, we, we had a good feeling it was probably gonna be offensive line or linebacker, but you know, which linebacker were they going to prefer here? They went with the guy with uh, the high traits, the high upside and, and Jamin Davis. I do wonder if Ousa Koromoa didn't have that questionable heart issue, if he would have been the pick. Cause that was, it seemed to be like the guy that was the chic pick for them in a lot of mock drafts leading up uh, to the event. Ben uh, thoughts on Jimmy Davis ending up there in, uh, in Washington. Yeah, athletic, explosive linebacker with coverage skills. You need someone to mirror these Zeke Elliott's and Saquon Barkley's of the division. And if you ever watch John Bostick play a thousand snaps over 16 games, you'd want a new linebacker too. So I'm just kidding. But uh, Bostick did have to, you know, wear a lot of hats for them last year alongside Cole Holcomb. So there's certainly a, a need to upgrade the positions and add some more athleticism, some more range, more athleticism. Jameen Davis certainly uh, checking those boxes for him. I like it. Well, let's get into our favorite picks here from this team. And we went through the entire gauntlet. Uh, Ben, I'll come right back to you. Let's bounce back. Your favorite pick uh, from this Washington football draft class. Well, we're going to dip down to uh, Derek Forrest out of Cincinnati, who I really liked. I thought he was one of the day three darlings as well. Three-year starter, over 450 special team snaps for the Cincinnati Bearcats and tested really well. 39-inch vertical or 11-foot broad. And he ran really well at 442. So he's got good size, good speed, good athleticism. And they love those kind of hybrid players over the middle. I know they're in a new regime and a new era, but going back from the wanting Sua Cravens and Keyshawn Jarrett's at a Virginia Techs and seems to be a lot of different bodies over the middle of the field as far as that nickel safety. I think Derek, Derek Forrest is going to end up being a starter uh, by season's end and a really good role player for them. 
uh, to me, I'm going to go with the guy that was drafted right around him, and that's Boise, Tate, Boise State tight end, uh, John Bates. I, I think when you look at Bates, look, Ian, or, um, uh, they had the starter last year in Logan Thomas. I wanted to say Ian Thomas, who uh, Rivera had down in Carolina. Uh, they had Logan Thomas in Washington last year, uh, converted quarterback, and he certainly performed well. The numbers were there. But I think when you look at John Bates, Ben, you you and I have talked about it numerous times. He was the guy like the, the, the day three, the mid-round pick tight end. I felt like had the highest upside in that – he was not a high volume target in the pass game in college, but he had pass game traits. So this is a guy that was a, a high school receiver, a good athlete that showed up uh, in testing. He tested well, uh, made some great catches over the course of his career, went down to mobile, made some great acrobatic catches down there during the week of practice as well. I think this is an interesting guy that they could end up uh, vying for a starting role at some point uh, in this rookie contract. I, I think John Bates is an interesting player, and we know what he can be as a blocker as well, uh, which will be important uh, for that team moving forward. I and, love players like that. Yeah. Sorry, oh, no sorry. question. No, you you're good. Quick. Yeah. I mean, he's caught 40 balls, 47 balls in his four years at Boise State. It's not because yeah. he's not athletic. They just don't feature the tight end position in the pass game. So it's a little bit of mystery to figure out, and you get to learn a little bit of that down at the senior bowl and talking to some people around him. And next thing you know, he's kind of an upside player that might have his best football ahead of him. I'm not saying he's George Kittle, but like that was Kittle coming out of Iowa, right? Like not I, saying he's not George Kittle. Right? <laughs> we don't know. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the thing. And that's the thing with these pass catchers is like, uh, sometimes they can be such a product of their circumstance, you know, depending on the situation that they were in the supporting cast around them. Uh, you know, he, he was not a high volume target at Boise state. Doesn't mean that he can't be uh, moving forward into the NFL. Uh, Dane, uh, of these picks here for Washington, which one stood out to you? Yeah, and credit to Bates because if I think it was maybe it was Tony Poljan when he got uh, it was a late scratch in the Senior Bowl. Bates got the call up. I mean, it just you know opportunity knocks and you got to be ready to answer. And I think he did uh, with what he did in Mobile, and that that helped get him, him drafted where he was. I don't know if he was considered maybe uh, as a, a a good chance to be drafted uh, until the Senior Bowl. So that certainly helped. Um, I'm going to go with what they did in the third round uh, with Benjamin St. Juice and Deami Brown. Uh, I mean, St. Juice being the Canadian native who, you know, he's a little older, uh, bounced from, from Michigan to Minnesota and put some pretty good tape uh, on, on, on film the last two years. Uh, obviously just, he stretched out, you know, six, three and a quarter, uh, you know, really long player, uh, you know, average long speed, but his twitch, his, his change of direction stuff is fantastic. Um, and so there's just a lot to like about the, the athlete that he is and, you know, just the way he tested the type of player the type of uh, corner he could be for you. Uh, and then with Deami Brown, a little surprise. I mean, I know there were some saying, Oh, he could sneak in the late first round and yep. you know, he's going to be a top 50 pick. And, uh, you know, I thought he was more late too. Um, and I, but I really liked Deami Brown. He's one of my favorite receivers in this class. So I was surprised he fell as far as he did into the, into the third, uh, you know, the best double move receiver in this draft, his vertical skills downfield. He's a little limited right now, but I don't, you know, he's not done growing as the receiver. And so, uh, you know, you add him to that offense where, I don't know that he's, I don't think he's going to start, you know, but he's going to be a guy that is when he gets on the field, he has the ability to take a top off the defense and stretch out that secondary. And, you know, that's just the threat of him out there is going to help that offense. And then, you know, in two years, two and a half years, you know, you're looking at him as maybe stepping in as a starter. So really like what they did in the third round. Ben, you and I have watched a lot of that Scott Turner offense in Washington. And you know, just think, think about how this receiver room comes together. Uh, you know, you've got Terry McLaurin, who, who is a stud. Obviously, you go and you get Curtis Samuel in free agency. And with his skill set to be kind of like that backfield action, horizontal stretch guy underneath, do all of those different things in the backfield. I feel like this addition of Deami Brown, he can be that true vertical threat where now you don't need McLaurin to just be the vertical threat. He can be a volume receiver. He could be an intermediate route runner and run those deep digs with uh, with Diami Brown running downfield. I mean, I, I think to me, uh, it really kind of brings the whole receiver room together. Obviously, they, they're looking for who could be that size guy, whether it's Kelvin Harmon coming off injury, Antonio Gandy Gold, maybe he takes the next step. But, uh, you know, you look at how this receiver room's come together. Uh, I do like the Brown addition as well. Yeah, and obviously Steven Sims Jr. is an athletic player. Yeah. They got Adam yep. Humphreys in free agency. That's we right. know what type of player he true could slot. be. Yeah. Dax Milne in the seventh round. A lot of interesting bodies, and nobody is kind of a true anything. No one's a true X or an F or a Z. There's a lot of guys that can wear different hats and line up all over the formation. Added a left tackle to maybe give the quarterback a smidge extra time to hit some of those receivers down the field as they grab Samuel Cosme out of Texas in the second round. Not many undrafteds again. 
but put me down for Jared Patterson out of Buffalo, making that roster and really pushing Gibson, JD McKissick, mm. Peyton Barber for a couple touches this year. I like it. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into just overall big picture takeaways uh, from this group. I think to me, Look, I, Kyle Smith uh, had been, I think he was the, the VP of player personnel uh, for a handful of years before Ron Rivera was hired. Um, and he was he was part of that draft class last year. But one of the hallmarks of how Washington was attacking the draft was heavy power five, the, the blue blood schools, Alabama, Ohio State. They were just collecting those guys in bunches. And I think over the last couple of years uh, with Ron Rivera there, I mean, we've seen Antonio Gibson uh, out of Memphis. We saw John Bates and Derek Forrest right out of the group of five schools. You know, Dax Milne, group of five player. Gandy Golden, group of five player. So they're willing to dip into the, the lower level of, of competition. And the other thing too, guys, just looking at this group as a whole, there were guys that have one year of production but not a lot of guys that were like, oh man, this guy was just productive throughout the course of his entire career. Like, I, I think that they're also kind of going for those upside plays. Hey, his, uh, his best football uh, could be ahead of him. Um, so that's one of the, one of the, my things that I, I've seen kind of just looking through the last couple of years of drafting here for Washington. Uh, Dane, is there anything that stands out to you from that group? Well, I, I think I just keep going back to their investment in, in the front seven. Uh, yeah. you know, even though there's new decision makers in the front office yep. led by Martin Mayhew, it's still about the front seven. And I think, when you have Ron Rivera wielding as much power as he does in that organization, it's not really a surprise that they would continue building on that side of the ball. You look at what they did in Carolina. They drafted, what, Shaq Thompson in the first round, yep. Luke Keekley in the first round uh, when Ron Rivera was there. Um, and so this, you know, going with the Jamin Davis at linebacker, they're, they're looking for, you know, to invest in those premium picks in the front seven. So just interesting that the philosophy, the names have changed in the front office, but not necessarily the philosophy. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I just love seeing, again, a, a kind of influx of senior bowl players, which you had called several months back that you thought we'd have nearly every senior bowl player drafted. I think it was pretty close. We'll have to check the numbers in the books out I on think that. that one, I, think the, I think the number was 24 went undrafted, which was a lot higher than I expected, but it was the highest percentage of senior bowl players drafted. So I'll, I'll hang my head on that one. Okay, a little, a little <laughs> backhanded compliment there. But just seeing guys like Bradley King and Chaka Tony going yep. in the seventh round, and they clearly have a type. You know, when they go after day three long snappers, they're not afraid of age as Cameron Cheeseman is 23 years old. They love their big 10 long snappers on day three as well. <laughs> University of Michigan, not afraid of a guy maybe has missed some time with some injury. So, you know, when they go after those day three long snappers, they have a type and they go for it. All right. So well, they draft when they draft long snappers, they clearly have a type, you know, the dairy, uh, you know, it's, it, it's definitely a type for sure. <laughs> the short board, short board at long snapper. Right. Right. Well, just the fact that Cam Cheeseman doesn't end up in green Bay. I mean, it's just a crime that all of us have to suffer through. Fair point. Yeah. It would have been great if they drafted another long snapper after right. they did Hunter yeah, Bradley, I think three years ago, you need those, you need that competition. <laughs> um, all right. So let's go uh, to the AFCs guys. Let's talk through the New York jets, uh, run through their picks real fast. Zach Wilson, obviously in the first round, Elijah Vera Tucker in the, first round as well. Uh, Elijah Moore at the top of round two. We'll talk we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, day three, bunch of selections here. Michael Carter, the running back from North Carolina. Uh, Jamie and Sherwood, a linebacker. He was a college safety at Auburn. Cornerback, Michael Carter from Duke. Corner, Jason Pinnock from, uh, from Pitt. And then three sixth round picks here. Hamza Nazardine, former safety at Florida State, now converting to linebacker. Brandon Eccles, the corner from Kentucky. And Jonathan Marshall, the defensive tackle from Arkansas. But guys, um, let's talk through, we, you know, we talked about Zach Wilson a lot and I feel, I feel like it was such a foregone conclusion that he was going to be the pick. I don't know that there's a lot more that we need to say necessarily about Wilson. I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on Vera Tucker, uh, and that selection there. Obviously they, they trade up in round one. They part with a couple picks there, uh, to get them to me. I think what this kind of speaks to, and maybe this speaks to like the Elijah Moore and Michael Carter selections as well. This is a team that has needs on defense. You look at their depth chart and say, yeah, like, you know, they've got needs on defense, but Sam Darnold doesn't work out. You go through all the, the history of the recent history of Jets quarterbacks. These guys have not worked out. Clearly, Joe Douglas is saying, okay, we're going to take our quarterback. Now well, let's let's surround him with as much as possible. You, know, you take Mekhi Becton last year. We're going to shore up the left side of that O-line. We're going to get him a top flight pass catcher. We go get Corey Davis in free agency as well. Uh, they're just trying to surround that franchise quarterback with as many weapons as possible and not really wait. Let's just get as many weapons for him uh, and as much protection for him as possible. That was really my read there on Elijah Vera Tucker, Dan. Yeah, no, I, you're absolutely right. It's it's all about surrounding the quarterback with with talent. And that, that's what was lacking from the previous regimes uh, is, you know, not being able to attack some of those premium positions on offense. 
Uh, you know, and we saw, uh, you know, the last two years under Joe Douglas, his, his only two drafts in the NFL, he's gone offensive line in the first round, back to back years. He's gone wide receiver in the second round, back to back years. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's no mystery what they're doing here. They're they're trying to invest in players that are going to help the quarterback. And you know, they they chose Zach Wilson as their guy, and then they saw Elijah Vera Tucker. And I, they've been, you know, it's. Some have had some mixed, uh, you know, reactions to this uh, trade. You know, they look at you know who, who they could have gotten it, you know, with that uh, with that later at twenty three. Uh, you know, Christian Dara saw possibly, or you know, and one of these other players, and then still having two third round picks. And uh, you know, I I love the trade. I, I love them going up, being aggressive. You're looking at Makai Becton, Elijah Vera Tucker uh, as you're on the left side of your offensive line for the foreseeable future. Uh, I, I I love that. And, you know, I, I'm a believer in, you know, having more draft capital so you can, you know, have as, you know, as, ma- as many uh, players to, you know, possibly hit. But when you have a, a player that you believe in, like a Vera Tucker, who I think is an easy player to believe in is high floor. Uh, what he, he also has a high ceiling, just the versatility that he brings you. Uh, you know, there's just so much to like about him. Uh, he's going to start from day one. I, I'm fully on board with uh, what it took to get there. And, you know, when you have a lot of draft picks, uh, especially on day two, I think you have the freedom to make a move like this no question. and feel comfortable. Yep. That's what, that's what I was going to say. It was honestly like, it's not even necessarily trade down and acquire as many picks as possible so you can get more shots at the apple. That, that no question, uh, is a big factor. But we talked about this with the Eagles. You know, when they trade back from six to from six to 12, it's like, all right, well, did you have the flexibility to then move up again if you want? And guess what? That's exactly what they needed, what they had. If they didn't have that flexibility to be able to move back up for Devontae Smith, they don't end up with Devontae Smith, a guy that obviously they valued very, very highly. And I think you look at the same thing, same thing here uh, with the Jets and Joe Douglas. Uh, ben, overall thoughts on that selection? Well, I just think there is few things more debilitating and defeating for an offense that needs to commit to the run that schematically and philosophically want to commit to the run under Michael LaFleur's offensive system that can't run the ball. So and I know you have a young quarterback. There's nothing worse than a team that wants to run it, can't run it. Then all of a sudden your young quarterback gets thrown into the fire, dropping back 50 times a game. They know they needed the quarterback, but they also needed to address the O-line, the run game, and all those surrounding parts of that quarterback to give him a really good situation and atmosphere to win, to be successful, to ascend, to develop. Um, and all of these quarterbacks, this class, the top five in particular, had very cushy systems in college. None of them were air raid guys. None of them were dropping back 40, 50 times, just throwing the keys of the offense and said, go get us yards and win us games. They were all fixtures of the run game, fixtures of RPOs. So they're going to go to their NFL teams. You better make sure they're fixtures of the run game, fixtures of RPOs with a balanced offense. So I like the Zach Wilson pick. The second that was over, trenches, 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 run game, run game. I think you saw that with Vera Tucker. I think you saw that with guys like even Elijah Moore a little bit more involved in the run game than I think people will think. And then Michael Carter later on. So run game, run game, run game. Now that you got your quarterback. And just make things easy for the quarterback. No question. Right? Yeah. That's the thing. When you look at Elijah Moore, uh, you know, we talked about that trait of his ability to play through contact. That is huge for a guy like Zach Wilson, right? Because, you know, when you look at the way that they played offense, uh, you know, it was a, a lot of point and shoot stuff. You know, they had the RPO built in, you had the, the outside zone run game and all that stuff. And that's going to be a fixture there in New York, but his ability to work underneath, to work in the intermediate game, to work down the field, you already have factor in a guy like Corey Davis, who has had success in a similar kind of scheme in Tennessee, right? With Arthur Smith, what was it? It was outside zone, play action, inside zone, duo, play action. Let's get him on the run. Corey Davis is going to be asked to do similar things. Uh, I think they're just kind of trying to piece this together to look very, very similar. Uh, I think it's huge for Zach Wilson. To me, like Elijah Moore, uh, outside of those first two picks, uh, that was my favorite of that group. I, I think it's a, a really, really fun pick. And it, again, compliments Corey Davis, right? Compliments uh, Denzel Mims, who they took in the second round last year. They have uh, you know guys on the roster who are more like you know true slot possession types, the, the Jameson Crowders, right? Now you've got a guy who could take the top off. He could still create yards after catch as well. Uh, Elijah Moore was a pick that really stood out to me. Ben, uh, was there a pick that really stood out to you outside of uh, round one? 
Yeah, it would definitely be Elijah Moore there, and you can yeah. already envision the inside zone of Michael Carter. Oh, the linebackers are biting. Quick twitch throw to the bubble to Elijah Moore. Or quick snap throw, throwing a slant to yep. Corey Davis. You know, you can already envision Zach Wilson using those arm angles and that quick twitch to get the ball out and to kind of let the skill players do the dirty work. So I love adding Elijah Moore, whether he's in the slot or a backfield role. Love the Michael Carter pick. We you know, obviously love his toughness in and outside the tackles and the screen game. Uh, so I just love all those parts to kind of make that quarterback's life easier. We see, we saw what Sam Darnold went through. He was obviously a number one quarterback in their eyes, but it didn't go as planned. Why? Not a lot of help, not a lot of supporting cast. They want to make sure that doesn't uh, happen again. Not even just the, the RPOs and the quick play action, but it's like play action boot. He's rolling to his right. Oh, there's Elijah Moore on the shallow cross or on the little slide route running underneath the offensive line. Like, you just kind of see that uh, picturing into the offense. Dane, uh, a pick that stood out to you there from that Jets group? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wanted to hit on Michael Carter just because yeah. you look at what worked at, in San Francisco. Uh, you looked at what's working in Green Bay. Uh, and I need you to this, specify which Michael Carter. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. this, yeah this is true. Right. This is true. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Jets have really cornered the market here uh, on Michael Carter's um, – uh, you look at, uh, you know, with the running backs with the 49ers and you look at Aaron Jones and with the Packers, I, I, I think there's some similarities with Michael Carter and what he offers. The strengths of his game, vision, uh, agility. Uh, I've called him a problem solving back because he's really, really good at surveying, making quick decisions and just getting himself out of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and he does it consistently. And so, you know, it's funny. I actually mocked him to the Jets in the fourth round and I didn't feel good about it because I was like, there's no way he's lasting this long. He's too good of a player. And lo and behold, he does. I think it's an absolute steal. And then on day three, really interesting. They went for a lot of high upside guys. You look at, uh, you know, Michael Carter, the second out of Duke. And you look at Jason Pinnock and Brandon Eccles. Jonathan Marshall is a great tester. Uh, and, and then the linebacker safety hybrids yeah. with Sherwood and Nigel Dean. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's just an interesting fit. And I'm, I'm just so excited to see how they're going to use these guys, how they're going to adjust their scheme. Uh, you know, are they going to be just overhang players? Uh, yep. uh, you know, you look at, uh, I don't think either one's, you know, Cam Chancellor, but, you know, you look at, you know, Robert Sala, he's got experience in that Seattle, uh, you know, scheme and just how they used a guy like that type of size. I, I don't think that's how they're going to use him, but I, I just, they're going to mix and match here. And they're going to, you know, I think at the very least, they're going to be special teams guys from day one, but then how are they going to be used on defense? Uh, I know they're listed at linebackers, but we know that they're going to be hybrid players and they're going to be flexible with how they actually uh, deploy them on the field. A lot of those hybrid guys, you know, whether it was these two players, uh, you know, Jacoby Stevens drafted as a linebacker, uh, Osa Koromoa drafted as a linebacker. So I am interested to see ultimately how many of these guys uh, are able to, to stick at linebacker, uh, how they're used and all that. There'll be uh, interesting case studies for sure moving forward. Those were the two players I wanted to talk about were Nazar Dean and Sherwood. I'm fascinated to see their usage. And even if they aren't uh, Cam Chancellor, strong safety in the box, run and roll down, cover three, post safety kind of stuff. Even if it's, hey, they, they play a lot of quarters last year uh, down in San Francisco. Split safeties, you don't need them to be super, super rangy, right? And so uh, that's why I'm interested to see, are they going to be pure will, will backers? I'm assuming they will because that's how they're being announced. But uh, their usage, I think, will be really, really fascinating. Nazar Dean obviously falls for some medical concerns um, due to the, the knee injury he suffered at the end of 2019. But uh, that, that's a, a hell of a player, a hell of a talent. Uh, they were able to get there in the sixth round. Uh, overall takeaways, guys, for me, um, you know, Joe Douglas very, very heavily leans into seniors, right? I think that that experience, you know, the, just his uh, – overall background coming up and through Baltimore early on. Uh, these picks tend to be juniors, you know, first round. He's had, now had th three first round selections uh, with the Jets. All three of them have been underclassmen. Outside of that, uh, only two underclassmen, all the rest uh, senior class uh, players. So that's certainly uh, a big theme to kind of look for. And I think just overall too, you know, he wants smart, tough football players. You know, they're, they're, the axiom in Baltimore was speed, toughness, and instincts. And I think that that speaks to the way that he's trying to build that team. Uh, you're going to find guys that kind of check those three boxes uh, will show up more often than not. Dane, uh, any other big picture takeaways looking at this Jets uh, draft class? No, I mean, I think, you know, you, you hit on a few of the key, uh, you know, points that I think you know, are important to Joe Douglas. Um, and, and then I just keep coming. I know we mentioned it before, but I keep coming back to, uh, Joe Douglas obviously paying attention to the Jets and what they failed to do through the draft and especially on offense. Uh, I mean, it's a question for you guys, a little bit of trivia here. When's the last time the Jets drafted an offensive lineman in the top 60 picks? 
Is it to break a shot? Yeah, 06. There you go. I mean, that's that's a long time. We're talking yeah. about, you know, so it's like, okay, you know, at some point here, you have to invest in those premium positions. And he does it here back to back first rounds. His only uh, you know, two years as general manager, and he's drafted offensive line back to back years. So I pretty pretty sure he's been paying attention to what hasn't worked uh in New York. So Prickershaw Ferguson and uh Mangold, they were the same year, right, Ben? Well, did they uh, both come in the, the same year together, I think? Because I think Mangold was a for uh was kind of like a Vera Tucker. He was like a late first round pick. Um, I believe they may have came in coming together. And so that was the same year, uh, in 06. But um, Ben, uh, any other big takeaways uh, from this Jets team? Can't verify that, but we'll get the research. I'll get you. I'm on it. Uh, Just really interesting to look at the teams doing the work after the draft. We just talked about the Washington football club who signed one undrafted free agent and Jarrett Patterson, the jets, Joe Douglas went the other way. I've added nearly a dozen, clearly a need for competition, particularly the back end of the roster. And even kind of to the front end of the roster, I could go up and down the 22 starters right now. I think five, I feel safe about that. That's their job heading into the season. Going to be a lot of young talent, a lot of competitions at a variety of spots. And there were some productive, interesting players they got after the draft, whether it was a Hamilcar Rashid or a Kenny Yaboa, Tristan Hodge, Notre Dame transfer that played a lot of ball for BYU. Players like that seemingly on every position group Some teams did, some teams didn't. The Jets said, hey, we can use a lot of influx of talent to the back end of the roster. Let's go sign them. So I think just gauging the way different teams kind of address the post-draft process is really fascinating. 2006, they took DeBrickershaw Ferguson and Nick Mangold in the first We're round. We're past so, it, uh, Fran. We're way past it on the rundown. Come on. <laughs> Let's get to Miami here. Uh, just a couple of teams left, guys. I'll run through the picture real fast. Only a handful of selections here. Jalen Waddle and Jalen Phillips. Uh, two Jalens there in round one for Miami. Round two, you get Javon Holland and Liam Eichenberg. So uh, a couple more top-end picks there for the Dolphins. Round three, they get the tight end, Hunter Long. Just two day three selections here for this team. Larnell Coleman, the, ta- the tackle from UMass, and then Jared Doak the running back from Cincinnati. Uh, Dane, uh, let's get into the, the top picks here. I'll, I'll let you make your uh, make your choice here if you want to talk about Jalen Waddle or Jalen Phillips, but ultimately, why do you think uh, they went either direction there? Because I think both are kind of interesting in their own right. Uh, well, I'll start with the first pick. You know, I think it's it's obvious the Dolphins wanted that premium pass catcher, simple as that. Uh, they were comfortable with Pitts, Chase Waddle. They knew that one of the three uh, were going to be there at that pick. Uh, and, you know, what? We'll, we'll never know, so it's kind of a moot point. But it'll be fast. It would be fascinating if the Bengals had taken Sewell at five. Which receiver would Miami have drafted at six? Chase or Waddle? I, I think some some that are, have been close to the team have said that they thought Waddle was their guy all along. And you know, aside from the talent, obviously the fact that Waddle has a history with Tua is part of the equation. You know, it, it and just like we talked about with the Giants, just like we talked about with the Jets. Helping the quarterback was a big part of the draft strategy here uh, with that trade up uh, into the top six picks. So uh, getting Jalen Waddle, who a lot of teams believed uh, was one of the first top two receivers in this draft. Uh, now it's going to be interesting to see his usage as a rookie. Uh, you know, how are they going to, uh, you know, introduce him to this offense and what kind of impact will he have uh, from the get go? I'm going to be honest. I didn't like just transitioning to Jalen Phillips. I That one surprised me more than maybe any other first round pick like player team fit uh, in the first round. Uh, I, I did that. I didn't quite see that as a Chris Greer selection. He's really only made uh, one really like day one or day two pick that's had like a medical red flag. And that was Tua last year. Right. And obviously maybe you make the concession uh, for the franchise quarterback, but uh, that one really, really surprised me uh, going back to what you said about Waddle. Um, you know, I, I think it would have been interesting if, if Jamar chase was on the board, which direction uh, they would have went. Uh, but clearly they go Waddle there, Ben, uh, any thoughts overall on uh, either of those first two round, the first two first round selections. Uh, two really good players adding yeah. an explosive uh, three level weapon in Jalen Waddle and contribute the screen game or excuse me, the return game as well. Yep. Jalen Phillips, I thought was the most complete pass rusher in this class. Just the medicals, the all fields yep. and character stuff to kind of dig into had no idea where the edge rushers were going to go in the pecking order. And it was really hard to project what teams wanted who and where they were going to fall. And mm. I think as we got later in round one, that even spoke more volumes with guys like, uh, you know, Peyton Turner going to the Saints in the back end of round one and guys like Boogie Basham and things like that getting yeah. pushed into day two. It was really tough to figure out who was coveted and why. But Jalen Phillips obviously was a, a darling to the Miami Dolphins going right there in their backyard. Really good player on the field. So I think they're kind of betting on the health and the upside and that his best football is probably ahead of him as well. 
favorite selection outside of the first round? Ben, I'll come to you. We got a, a handful of selections here. What was uh, your favorite? I love seeing Javon Holland yeah, go that early, particularly that early in the second round before Trayvon Mareg, before Richie Grants, before Owusu Koromoas. Yep. This is a guy that opted out, but had an incredible, incredible resume up there at Oregon. Really thick, tough slot player that had no problem sticking his nose in the run game. Really good size. He wasn't one of these skinny 175 pound nickels. So 200 and seven pounds, six foot, four, four, five type of defensive back that you want to call him a safety. You want to call him a nickel. He's a little bit of both that I thought he was a really good player and couldn't figure out why some people were talking about the, uh, you know, the, the kid from Indiana more over him and some other yeah. guys. And uh, I'm just happy that kind of my thoughts were validated with where he was selected. And he obviously was a guy they wanted very early on day two. You know, they, they've they really kind of placed a priority on seniors when they get to day two and day three. Um, he's one of the few underclassmen that they've taken uh, really under Chris Greer uh, on day two. Uh, and to me, I, I, and I also was interesting because I think that there was, you know, there was a buzz about, you know, that how are they going to feel about opt-out players? And, and obviously with him, uh, he was their, uh, I think their only opt-out selection. Uh, yeah, he, he would be the only player they took uh, that was an opt-out. But, uh, you know, this is a guy with a versatile skill set. He fits that defense really, really well uh, with that versatile skill set. Um, really, really impressive. Dane, uh, who's the guy that stands out to you outside of the first round for them? Oh, I got to go with my boy, Larno Coleman, uh, right. in the seventh. Uh, you know, I, I thought he was the perfect developmental tackle uh, in the later rounds. Uh, you know, there's so much to like about his size, 6'6", six, six, uh, 35 and a half inch arms, really light feet for a guy that size. Uh, talking to his coaches, they raved about his ability to learn his character, his football mm -hmm. character. Um, it, it's, he still has ways to go. It, it's going to take some patience from the coaching staff, but if you're going to bet on a guy, this is one of the guys you bet on. He was one of my top 10 sleepers this year. Uh, and, and so very, very happy that he was drafted. So let's go uh, over the top. Just overall thoughts uh, here on the Dolphins. I, I mentioned earlier, you know, that it's a heavy lean towards seniors, heavy lean towards traits players and guys from Power Five conferences. Uh, and I think that that they kind of held chalk uh, there. I, I think for the most part, uh, when you look at these selections, a lot of guys that uh, traits players, you know, something that you can work with and build on. Uh, you know, one special attribute that they can kind of hang their hat on. Uh, maybe Liam Eikenberg doesn't quite have that from a trait standpoint, but just a rock solid player from a power five blue blood program uh, that really kind of fits them. Uh, Dane, any overall thoughts, just kind of looking at this class as a whole. I was really interested in the Hunter long pick. Uh, yeah. and how much, how much they they look at this tight end position. I mean, Durham Smythe, Mike Kosicki, Adam Shaheen, all three were kind of key parts of their offense last year. Mm. Then they add uh Seathan Carter and free agency from the Bengals. They gave him a three-year deal. So now they're four deep. And then they add Hunter Long with a top 100 draft pick. Obviously, I mean, Brian Flores, he's coming from New England. He, he was an assistant all those years. Uh, you know, when the tight end was a big part of that offense with Gronkowski and Hernandez and all that. It's pretty clear how how important they feel the tight end position is in that offense. They want it to be a central part of what they do. So it's just really fascinating to see the ways that they have invested in the tight end position. And really, they're five deep right now. We'll see, you know, if, if that changes at all between now and, and uh, you know, the opening uh, opening week. But still, just really interesting, the tight end position, how, how much they uh, they invest in that position. Ben, how about you? Yeah, just looking at the roster, they obviously have a type at certain spots. The offensive line is getting big. It's getting yeah. nasty. They have Solomon Kinley, Robert Hunt off the right side. Yeah. They brought in DJ Fluker. like seeing Robert Jones as one of their undrafted kids out of Middle Tennessee State, who's a really interesting player. That's secondary. Some big corners, some big nickels, and Javon Holland. You have Eric Rowe and Byron Jones out there to pair, obviously, on the opposite side is Xavier Howard. Brought in Justin Coleman at nickel. It's a big physical football team. And my prediction, Jarrett Dopes is going to lead them in carries by Whoa. season's end. He is a tough bowling ball between the tackles. I think fits the personality of their trenches and of that offensive line. I like Gaskins. I like Salvin Ahmed. I think they got some nice parts there. But Jarrett Dopes, I think his play personality is really going to fit with what they want to do on offense. Well, that's a that's a juicy one right there uh, to, to wrap up the Dolphins. Uh, let's go into the Buffalo Bills here. I'll run through their picks real fast, and we'll break it down, guys. Uh, Greg Rousseau in round one out of Miami. Another pass rusher in round two. Carlos Boogie Basham from Wake Forest. Uh, Spencer Brown, the Northern Iowa tackle on in round three. Day three, handful of picks here. You've got Miami, Ohio offensive tackle Tommy Doyle. Houston speedster wide receiver Marquez Stevenson. 
Pitt safety DeMar Hamlin, Rashad Wild Goose, the corner from Wisconsin, and Jack Anderson, the guard from Texas Tech. Uh, Dane, let's go to round one. Greg Rousseau, uh, thoughts there uh, on that selection and that fit? Uh, the Bills had to get better and younger at edge rusher. And Rousseau, if he was their top guy at 30. And it's interesting. There were four pass rushers drafted in a five-pick span there, uh, th- uh, 28 to 32. And I doubt anyone would have guessed the order would have been Peyton Turner, Rousseau, Owe, then Tryon. But it just speaks to how different yeah. you know each organization values different things, especially in, in edge rushers. And for the Bills – they're banking on Rousseau's length and his initial quickness. Uh, that, that's really the key traits with him that you're, you're you're hoping develop. He's still raw in areas, which it is understandable for a guy that has basically one year of college tape. And then he didn't start playing the positions until his senior year of high school. So uh, I'm also interested with Rousseau, the angle of the opt-outs. You know, there are several opt-outs that it really didn't affect them. Jamar Chase, Penny Sewell. But if Rousseau plays this past season and comes anywhere close to his 2019 production, he's going top 15. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, maybe he you know, plays this year, he doesn't opt out, and he struggles. Uh, maybe he falls out of the first round. So you know, it's just an interesting you know, what if with him. But the Bills willing to bet on the traits, and you know, we'll have to look at this pick in a couple of years because we're not going to know if this is going to be a hit or miss for, for, I think, quite some time. Guys, one thing that stands out, and you just kind of uh, you said it there, Dana, and that's what kind of kind of piques my interest because you talk about okay, what what could he have been? Or maybe we got a, we got a steal here a little bit late. He could have gone a little bit higher. I kind of wonder. I'm looking at this the, this group of players that Brandon Bean has selected as general manager, and he's been the GM since the 2018 draft. Whether you're talking about Rousseau, who goes to his pro day, and I think a lot of people expected him to really really test well, and he he didn't really test all that well. You know, when you look at the overall numbers, uh, they, they weren't super impressive. I think you could have said the same thing about like Devin Singletary when he was a day two pick. Marquez Stevenson this year uh, didn't test super great. Um, I'm just like looking down at the list of some of the guys they've taken, like Teron Johnson out of Weber State. Uh, you know, look at Gabe Davis. He didn't quite test to the level uh, that people expected. Uh, Voshan Joseph, when he was coming out of Florida, he was a freak athlete on film, but did not test well at all. There are a bunch of guys, and I kind of wonder if, they, if that's a, a sneaky indicator for them. Is there, do they feel like they're getting value in a player that may, many people thought was going to test well? didn't and now we're getting a little bit later uh than uh that people expected that's kind of like an interesting i don't want to get too over the top too quickly um but as you said that that kind of like jogged my my thought process looking at this list um but getting back to rousseau uh ben overall thoughts on on his fit and just the overall selection yeah i thought dean touched on it pretty well there a guy that's only played uh just under 600 snaps in his college career some of the fewest uh on field experience i've ever seen from a prospect as long as i've been studying the draft and there's a couple guys in this draft for a number of reasons, whether it's injuries or opt-outs or COVID uh, that have kind of played into that. But Rousseau, obviously a meteoric, you know, ascension through 2019. If he played in 2020, does he just keep going up and up? And I think that's the kind of speculation you have. Could yep. he end up, could have, he have been a top 10 pick with a 2020 season or maybe do you show a little bit more of what he can't do with more play time. And that's the kind of risk reward with playing and putting yourself out there and exposing yourself is you could be exposing the negatives too. Uh, so I think they're betting on his upside, which there's few players that have more boom bust upside than Gregory Rousseau. Really, really interesting influx of talent, not just there, but their second round pick and some of their offensive linemen later on. I think when you look at even just like we talk about types all the time, it feels like, when you look at Brandon Bean, the players that they had in Carolina, some of the guys that he's brought in during the time in Buffalo, those defense events uh, in that scheme, typically more of like the power leverage, you know, I'm going to clap, push the pocket. Like Boogie Basham fits that to a T. They took Epinesa in round two last year, fits that to a T. Uh, some of the other players they've taken at that position fit. Rousseau is not like that guy. He's more like the, you know, I'm going to run around you. There were times where he showed uh, the, you know, he'll go long arm and try and go through your chest. But uh, I do think that was interesting as well. It kind of bucks that trend uh, in terms of the type of rushers uh, that they typically select. Um, Let's go into our our favorite picks outside of the Rousseau selection. Ben, I'll bounce it right back to you. Uh, Your favorite uh, from outside of round one here for the Bills. Well, right there, Boogie Basham. Obviously, I love his ability to play through contact, just being a relentless, strong player. Nothing finesse about this kid. I think he's going to fit in really well with the Mario Addisons and Jerry Hughes style of power player that maybe is a little bit on the undersize as far as length and, uh, you know, strides and things like that. But I didn't think Edge Rusher was a huge need for them. I like Jerry Hughes. I like Addison. Epinesa is a nice developmental player trying to figure out how to get the most out of Ed Oliver. They have some nice players in there, but adding 
Rousseau and Carlos Basham. It's a pretty good front seven. A lot of guys that can move all around and looking at the offensive lineman later, I'm assuming Fran, they had something on the top shelf. They haven't been able to get to for a couple of years. So they added some six, eight tackles to make <laughs> sure that top shelf is accounted for. I'm not sure if they're going to be starters in 2021 or even really backups, but a lot of interesting players there on uh, middle rounds. Listen, the celery seed comes sometimes gets bumped all the way back there. You uh, you need it for that one recipe. You need somebody to get up there and uh, and go find the celery seed. It, to celery me, like seed. Uh, to me, like uh, I love the Tommy Doyle pick. Uh, he was one of my favorite kind of like developmental day three tackles uh, in this class. But I, to me, like Demar Hamlin from Pitt is a perfect perfect scheme fit uh for for this uh, for this system here in Buffalo with Sean McDermott. Uh, you know, obviously quarters heavy. He was a, a great quarter safety uh, down there for the for the Panthers out there at Pitt. So to me, this one makes so much sense. That one was a perfect apples to apples scheme comparison. Uh, I do love that fit. I like. I think Rashad Wild Goose uh, could end up really competing for start or competing for snaps uh, on the interior as well as a slot player. Uh, Dane, was there a favorite pick for you outside of round one? Uh, I mean, you you touched on Doyle, but I mean, I'll, I'll kind of go uh, a little further with him because he, you and I both, and I, I think you know Ben as well, really likes what he had to offer. And, and this is a player that hasn't been playing offensive tackle very long. Uh, he was a defensive end, yep. uh, played a little bit of tackle, but a little bit of offensive line in high school. Former hockey player, uh, you know, didn't really have a 2020 season. Only played in three games. Uh, but you know, based off of what he did in 2019, based off of the little that he showed, uh, this year, you see a guy that, uh, it, it feel like, you know, he has yet to play his best football. I, I think at worst with a little more developing, you're getting a guy that you think can be a swing tackle for you and, you know, maybe, uh, an eventual starter. So I yeah, love the Doyle pick there. Uh, it, what fifth round. I mean, that's, yep. that's just crazy value. Yeah. yeah Fran, he- Fran, I thought your DeMar Hamlin pick fit perfectly with your great player, not a great tester. Yeah. This is a guy that yep. ran four six zero and four five nine at two hundred pounds, and you know, former corner background, a guy that should be a better athlete through the metrics and testing. Uh, I'm not sure if maybe Paris Ford overshadowed his poor testing yeah. uh, in that pro day at Pitt, right. but Demar Hamlin, another guy with good tape, good character, everything checks the boxes, just didn't test particularly well, which mm-hmm. seems like the Bills are more than okay with that. Uh, to me, the I think when you look big picture, uh, I mentioned the exactly what you just brought up and like the, the the testing issue. But then I think too, you know, this is a team that they just they're collecting like size and physicality. I know that Brandon Bean has kind of talked about that. Hey, we want we want big bodies in Buffalo for the cold and uh, you know play late into the season and things like that. I was a little surprised that they didn't get a little bit faster overall uh, at the skill positions, not until getting Stevenson uh, in the middle of day three. But um, overall, I think they stuck true. Uh, to that mindset, to that identity that they want to get bigger. If you look at that, you know, just the look at their their high picks over the last few years, you know, whether you look at uh, Tremaine Edmonds in the middle of that defense, um, you know, adding size to the trenches and, you know, A.J. Epinesa, Zach Moss, a big physical back, Harrison Phillips, uh, you know, you just go right down the line. A lot of guys, they spent a lot of high picks on trench players and just big body players. So uh, that one, I think they stuck true uh, to that. Dane, uh, any big over the top uh, observations for you with this Buffalo team? I, and this this is just a general observation for, yeah. if in the NFL. Just when you have a roster that is uh, as set as the Bills, I mean, you can double up at premium positions like the yeah. Bills did. You know, they go edge rusher first two picks uh, with Rousseau and Basham. Then they go offensive tackle with their next two picks with Spencer Brown, Tommy Doyle. So, you know, when you have a roster that you're comfortable with, that is a playoff caliber roster and you feel really, really good with where you're at. You can, you can do that with premium positions. And that's exactly what this team did. Uh, And, you know, down the road, you know, they're going to, you know, reap the reward of of what that uh, could end up being. So uh, it's really interesting strategy with, you know, I thought they would go with, maybe even a running back or maybe with uh, a wide receiver even higher, but you know, they stay true to their value board yep. and, and you know, who was there for them. And so just an interesting strategy. Uh, ben, how about you wrap us up? Yeah. I think I kind of echo those, that sentiment. I think they yeah. went into the draft thinking we don't have any needs. We're ready to play today. We're going to be a competitive team. Our roster right now, we think is a playoff type of team. And I think they have high expectations. They didn't get crazy in free agency, trying to fill some of those holes, added some nice pieces with like Emmanuel Sanders and maybe a backup tackle, like a Bobby Hart, but it was pretty quiet in free agency. I think it was one of the better teams heading into the off season. And like you always say, Fran show up to the draft, ready to play. 
and your draft board should be a lot more friendly. You don't have yep. to be as aggressive towards the need. So that's a, a team I'm looking at up and down the roster, trying to find holes, trying to find concerns. Not a whole lot. Yeah, not for not for tomorrow. Uh, that's uh, that's for certain. Uh, well, guys, this has been fun. Uh, we'll do this a couple more times here. We'll, we'll kind of finish going around the uh, the rest of the NFL, wrap up this 2021 NFL draft. Until next week, uh, we will talk to you next time here on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. Raise a glass to that comforting feeling of an Eagles touchdown with the all-new Broad and Patterson Wine Collection created in partnership with Wink. Featuring a Cabernet, a Rosé, and a Chardonnay, Broad and Patterson wines are the perfect pairing for any occasion. Now you can bring the sweet taste of victory with you to a dinner with friends or to the tailgate with your game day crew. Purchase online today at philadelphiaeagles.com slash wine to stock up and have Broad and Patterson delivered right to your door. A portion of proceeds from every bottle benefit Eagles Autism Foundation. All 32 teams are always under construction. How are they being built? Let's check out the blueprint. All right, well, excited to welcome in here for the very first time on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Friend. Uh, Mark Schofield does a great job breaking down quarterback play, uh, knows this Patriots team inside now. Mark, thanks so much for joining us here on the show, man. Fred, it's great to be with you, buddy. Always great. We get a chance to catch up. I wish we were doing this down in Mobile yep. uh, over a drink or two, but we'll we'll settle for the podcast and the Zoom for now. And hopefully, you know, next January we'll get to catch up in person. But excited to be here and talk about this Patriots draft class. No, and we were talking before we started rolling and you know discussing like how much we love discussing the the fits. You know, we spend so much time talking about all of these players and we don't spend enough time afterwards talking about the fits. And I love this part of time of year too, because we get our, our first looks at the prospects for next year. The guys we're going to be talking about over the next 12 months. But uh, I think it's also very, very important for us to be able to talk about these guys as well. And now that they've ended up on teams and also just the process, right. And, and what, what the why's behind some of these picks. And so uh, I guess before we get into that with this Patriots class, going into this, into this draft uh, before the draft could uh, took place, could you name a couple of trends, you know, two, three trends that stand out to you about the way uh, Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots operate uh, for draft season? You know, is there uh, anything about the types of players they look for, prioritizations on speed or age or you know, anything like that? Is there we can go, kind of go one by one, but are there a trend or is there a trend or two that kind of stands out to you uh, when looking at this Patriots team? Well, I think generally, Fred, like Bill Belichick and the way that this front office handles the draft is they look at a couple of things. And I think first is value. You know, they will grade the players the way they grade them and they won't necessarily like deviate too much from that in terms of a draft spot comes up, say it's 15th overall, 46, where they originally had their second round pick, whatever. And they're, they're not going to wildly overreach just because, oh, you might have to fit this need. You might have to, you know, fill this position. If the value isn't quite right in their mind, they're not going to deviate from their system. They've got a graded system. You know, we we saw Ernie Adams, right? We all probably saw yep. that video when he made the the, the pick in the seventh round, you know, he was one of the people that sort of came up with their graded system. That's a system that a lot of teams now use, yep. you know, you know, this, you know, you've done it. You've been in these rooms, um, the number grades with some letters for whether it's medicals or other sort of flags you want to attach to a player. They're not going to deviate too far from that. So value is certainly one of the things that they sort of take into stock, take into account when they're making picks. Now, if there are needs and you have to sort of reach just a little bit, perhaps higher than your grade, they will do that. And I think they did that with the pick in the first round. But for the most part, value is something that they certainly look for first. And two, it's not like, you know, the they're, they're a team that is not afraid to stick their neck out uh, on a player. And, right. you know, you might look at this and say, oh, well, this guy was so low on everybody's boards. Uh, on their board for their team, for their system, they value him here. And right. you can go both sides of that argument, um, but they, uh, over the course of time, they have not been afraid to you know, buck the consensus. And oh, absolutely. Some, sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't, but I, that, that kind of speaks to their process. Yeah, I mean, you look at last year, Kyle Duggar in the second round. I mean, he was an excited young player that a lot of people thought was going to get picked sometime on day two. They had no problem drafted him in the second round. And I think what was interesting about the Duggar pick last year is, generally speaking, Belichick in this front office has valued things like special teams play, mm -hmm. yep. captains, seniors, multiple-year starters. It seemed like last year, and the Duggar pick particularly, was kind of the first year that they took a swing in a different 
different direction and on a- athleticism, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because Duggar was very much an athletic freak, tested incredibly well at the combine. And rather than making their usual pick of, oh, this is going to be the multiple year starter with a, a mainstay on special teams and a, a captain, they bet on the athleticism. So that might be something that they're starting to do a little bit differently. But overall, you know, in terms of things that they typically value at the position, I think pedigree is one. You know, they look at somebody that's come from, you know, tough level of competition. You certainly see that in this draft class, as I know we're going to talk yeah. about. But they like players from big schools who played on big stages, that played in big moments. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to shy away from the moment when it's a Monday night football game against the Buffalo Bills or something like that. They'll have been in bigger environments or perhaps environments just as big. Yeah, I think when you look, obviously, all of his first round picks, just uh, I'm looking at since like 2011, uh, they've all been power five players. Yep. Only, I mean, a bunch of t- day two selections, only a couple have come from outside the power five. I'm looking, uh, just looking at the group right here. You mentioned Kyle Duggar last year. Uh, obviously, he came from the uh, from the D2 level, but Youngstown State, you had Derek Rivers in 2017, Antonio Garcia from Troy the same year. Then you got to go back to 2014. It was Jimmy Garoppolo. And before that, it was Jamie Collins and Aaron Dobson. There was like 24 other guys that were all power five players. So yeah. uh, certainly a heavy lean uh, towards the guys that come from that kind of that, that kind of pedigree. Uh, is there anything else uh, that stands out to you, I guess, before we uh, move on to this class? Well, I think traditionally they look at fit. They look at what they do. And the Patriots are one of those organizations, and you know this, Fred, from covering this league and from being in these rooms. They ask the question, what can he do, right? Sometimes you hear teams talk about players can't do. Us in the media sometimes focus and harp on, all. Oh, this quarterback can't make reads or this guy can't, you know, escape from the pocket. The Patriots ask the question, and they do this in free agency as well. What can he do, right? What can this player do? And does that fit what we need? Does that fit what we do? And they approach it from that lens. And so, you know, Mac Jones, 15th overall, it's not so much the focus on athleticism or things like that is what can he do? And is that going to help us? And so that question, that fit is also, also something they look at. And finally, we all know it, that three cone drill, right? You know, they love that three cone drill. They love that change of direction ability. Obviously at the wide receiver position, but, Across the board, they look at this as a change of direction game. How quickly can you change directions as an offensive player? How quickly can you mirror that change of direction as a defensive player, particularly if you have to cover whether you're a linebacker, corner, safety, whatever. And so that three cone drill is one of those drills that we joke about it sometimes. Oh, you know, a receiver posts an incredible three cone drill and everybody posts the gift for the memes of of Bill Belichick (laughs) walking out of the tunnel. But it's true. They they look at that drill as a test of where the game is, where it's going and what these people need to be able to do on a football field. And I see, I love this because I actually have not, I did not know this. So and that's why I love having these conversations with people that look at these teams so closely because they bring that to the forefront and for, for people that are outsiders or are looking at all 32 teams, you don't necessarily, uh, you're not always in tune with that. So uh, I love that. Fred, I gonna, you'll, I notice, ask. you'll notice it now, Fred, anytime you see a good three code <laughs> drill next draft cycle, you will see the, the, the videos of Belichick walking out of the tunnel at Detroit or the one of him sitting in the stands so with the, the binoculars. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. <laughs> you'll start to see them more and more. It's like when Got you it. first, I remember when I first heard a baseline when I was a young kid growing up and then all I could hear was baselines and songs. It's going to be the same thing for you and, and Belichick and the three cone. I love it. So, and I was going to ask too, it's not, is it a specific position, but uh, as you mentioned, it's really kind of across the board, but especially receiver, you said, especially with receiver, particularly look, I know the Patriots have gotten the boundary receiver position, the X of the Z they've kind of missed on those guys, yeah. the keel Harry, the most recent example, but they've got the slot receiver position down pat. Right. And a lot of that is that three cone drill because you know, that Patriots playbook, those option routes, juke, all that stuff they do underneath, those change of direction routes, pivots, whips, all that stuff, that's the that's the three-cone drill translating to the field. And so particularly with the slot receiver position and in response to that slot defensive backs, if you've got a good three-cone drill, odds are the Patriots are going to be calling you around draft time. All right, so let's uh, run through these picks because they did select a receiver, but it was with their final pick in this draft. But uh, round one, you go quarterback Mac Jones from Alabama. Round two, you've got Alabama defensive tackle Christian Barmore. Round three, Ronnie Perkins, the pass rusher from Oklahoma. Then on day three, a handful of picks here. Oklahoma running back Ramon J. Stevenson, Michigan linebacker Cam McGrone, Missouri safety Josh Bledsoe, Colorado tackle Will Sherman, and then lastly, Central Florida wide receiver Trey Nixon. So, uh, Mark, let's get into the top pick here. Mac Jones, um, kind of a, if, if Mac Jones didn't go number three to San Francisco that, you know, as many people, uh, kind of pointed to, 
this was kind of the chic landing spot it was all, you know, him landing with the, with the Patriots, whether it was via trade up or falling all the way down uh, to 15. When you look at the player and the fit, what are your thoughts with Mac Jones ending up uh, with Josh McDaniels in New England? Well, it's interesting, Fed. A lot of people sort of, like you said, once there was the trade up, they said, oh, San Francisco's coming up for Mac Jones because, you know, Kyle Shanahan has been able to make quarterbacks like Mac Jones work in the past. But when people sort of said, okay, well, if he doesn't go to San Francisco, where else could he land? A lot of people immediately drew their eyes to the New England Patriots at 15, like you said, whether via trade up or he slides to them at 15. And I think the connections are somewhat similar, right? You look at traditionally the Patriots pass a game under, you know, Tom Brady. It's that quick strike passing game, an emphasis on short area throws, short area reads, quick decisions, ball placement in the short area, and maximizing yardage after the catch. And if you watch Mac Jones sort of in a vacuum, those are some of the things that do stand out about his game. But I I do want to caution people, the sort of scheme fit isn't as one-to-one and as neat as mm. people think it's going to be. Benjamin Solak, who we both know and love, wrote a great piece last Friday about it over at the Draft Network talking about how Mac Jones was buoyed by a lot of RPO stuff. You know, yeah. I think, you know, whether it's Sports Info Solutions or PFF or Ben's own chart, and he was anywhere from like 10th to 3rd overall in RPO usage. Well, RPO is not a ton of what the Patriots do, but I actually wrote a piece today about this and they used it 18 times, I think, or Cam Newton used RPO designs 18 times last year, which was a big jump for them. And so they're going to have to evolve the offense a little bit, but I think generally sort of conceptually, the emphasis on yardage after the catch, the emphasis on short area accuracy and quick throws, that's kind of Matt Jones. Now, I do think that there are things that they'll evolve offensively. His ability to throw downfield with touch is something I think they'll want to incorporate. We all know the Patriots love to use play action. Well, you can see a lot of examples of Mac Jones making throws on play action designs, particularly as you like to look for that back to the defense time of play action where you lose sight of the secondary. So that shrinks your decision-making time, your time to read the defense. Mac Jones can give you that. And so there are things that he can do or did at Alabama that will be fits for the New England Patriots, but they're going to have to open up the playbook a bit they're gonna have to incorporate some of the college concepts like they did with cam newton last year but like they'll really have to do for mac jones to ease that transition for him and i love the phrasing there and i'm so glad you brought cam into the because that was gonna be my follow-up was like you know when when the patriots signed cam newton last offseason was like oh well they're gonna have to change their offense they're gonna have to incorporate more of these college concepts and do more things like this and i feel like now with the mac jones edition you have to do that even more so. And I, f- I don't feel like the, the casual fan thinks about it that way. They're like, oh, well, you know, Mac Jones is, a, is your prototype pocket passer. You just, you know, you can, you can run anything with him. No, like you want to be, you have to, you want to be able to spread it out. And, and we talked about it earlier uh, with Ben and Dane, uh, with what the Jets are doing with Zach Wilson. Like you want to try and make him as comfortable as possible. You want to try and take as much off his back as possible. I am interested though, uh, you know, whether it's watching training camp this summer, watching preseason, Watching that, how the how the scheme meshes to both players because they do have um, some you know some differing skill sets. Uh, I think that'll be interesting. Two very different quarterbacks stylistically. I mean, with Cam, it's a very I'd always say it's it's a violent throw in motion. He relies on torque. He's more of that home run hitter type of quarterback. And you think back to last year, right? We all remember that week two game at Seattle. Now the Patriots lost that game, but it suddenly seemed like wow, New England has a vertical based passing offense. They're almost showing the ability to throw some downfield haymakers in the passing game. Mm. Whereas Mac, he certainly has, he can throw downfield with touch, with timing, with anticipation. He throws that slot fade ball better than perhaps anybody else in this class. You could see him making that throw. There's a great example of him against Mississippi state doing that to Devonta Smith, who, Listeners to this show are probably well aware of what he can do in the downfield yeah. passing game, but he's throwing that with anticipation. And so there's some of that, but they are two very different quarterbacks, but all offensive coaches right now, when you draft that young quarterback, you have to, the first thing I talked to Matt Bowen a couple of years ago about what he would do if he were an offensive coordinator, or offensive minded head coach in the NFL that drafted a rookie quarterback. He said his first call would be their college coach and then to their high school coach. What did you run with this kid? What did he like to run? And then how quickly can I turn those concepts into our own playbook? Because yeah. that three year development window here, here's the playbook. Here's the clipboard. Now stand on the sideline for two years and watch before we get you into the games. That's gone. Like you have to get young quarterbacks on the field and playing. Otherwise you're going to waste the cost controlled nature of their contracts. And so you 
offensive coordinators have to look at what they were running in high school, look at what they were running in college and get those designs into playbooks now and get them on solid ground, whether it's RPOs, play action, whatever it is, you better get those into your playbook for these rookie QBs. And and you know this from playing the position, like it's so much of it is confidence and comfort. And so letting that guy build that confidence, you know, no matter if we're talking about schematically you know, personnel wise, play calling standpoint, leaning on the run game, whatever it is, you want to, you want that guy to be able to build as much confidence and comfort and in, in, in what you're doing as possible. And then that allows him not, not only to play fast and, and loose and, and, you know, hopefully be productive, but by year four, year five, year six, year seven, you're now getting to that master's level and just get him to that finish line, get right. him there. So then that way you can hand it all off to him and because chances are, but they're in the rookie deal. You're not going to be able to do that. No, but you want to get them there by the time it's time for that second right. contract, right? Yep. So if you've, you know, put him in a position to be comfortable, to be confident, to start speeding up his mind, because all these quarterbacks, you know, whether it's Mac Jones or everybody said was like the great processor of the group or Justin Fields, who people said couldn't process, which is a position I wholeheartedly disagree with, but it doesn't matter. All these guys have to get faster yep. because the NFL defenses are better. The defenders are better. The coverages are much more complex. And you can't just stay pat with your sort of process and speed as a quarterback right now coming into the NFL. You all have to get faster. The way to do that is to give them stuff they're familiar at running. So by the time it's time to make that decision on contract two, they're ready for the master's level course at the position. I love it. I, I, we could have that conversation. That could be a whole other podcast, yeah, uh, which we might have to do at some point. That sounds uh, like good summer, Jude right? content for me, man. <laughs> uh, so let's let reflecting back on the, some of the points you brought up earlier, uh, you know, what their DNA is in terms of, you know, building their team. When you look at this draft class as a whole, uh, anything that kind of resonates with you or like, yeah, they, they kind of stay, they went chalk here. They, they stuck to the blueprint with, uh, with how they kind of built this class. Christian Barmore in the second round. And, and, and I told people on the show that I host a Patriot show, I prepared them for Barmore at 15. Yeah. I thought Christian Barmore at 15 might have been a very Belichickian move, right? Thin position group, not a lot of talent, a lot of question marks about it. But a lot of people looked at Christian Barmore and said, look, if you're going to go defensive tackle early, this is the guy. You know, he has the pedigree. He has the Saban background. So it's a defensive scheme fit. A lot of one-to-one between what Belichick does and what Nick Saban does defensively. And so I told a lot of people, and I had people in, in and around the league, not within the Patriots building, but other teams tell me, Barmore at 15 might be something you want to get ready for because that just screams Belichick. Yep. And so to get him in the second round, very much a Belichick type move. And look, they've got some decisions down the road about defensive tackle. They wanted to sort of rebolster that defensive front. And then you look at the third round, Ronnie Perkins, the pass rusher from Oklahoma. Who yep. Had some up and ups and downs along the way and maybe didn't test as well as people were hoping. But you watch him against Tevin Jenkins, who obviously went pretty early in the draft too. And you see somebody that can contribute off the edge as a pass rusher and give Belichick the ability to sort of scheme up some pressure looks and some pass rush as he's known to do. And so I think the Barmore and Perkins picks were very much sort of chalky Belichick. Like, look, we addressed the need in quarterback that everybody said we had to address. And we did it in the first round. Now we're going to get back to our basics. We're going to build in the trenches, add to the defensive front, give ourselves some options up front to play some stunt games, some twist games, some pressure games, and get after the opposing quarterback on Sundays. So we know about the the Alabama connection, obviously with Nick Saban. Um, you know, back it used to be Greg Schiano at Rutgers, and he's starting to build that back up. So maybe we kind of readdress that here in the next couple of years. The other connection, I feel like, with it from a, a team to school standpoint, Michigan, right? I, I, you saw that this year with Cam McGrone. Uh, last year they traded up for Josh Uche. They took Chase Winovich the year before. Uh, they had on Wayno last year, obviously on the, on the opposite side of the ball, but they got him on day three. Is that a is that a Don Brown connection in your mind? Is it a, just a is it a Harbaugh connection? Is it a, a it's, program? What, what, it's what is a it? Don mind? Brown connection in one sense, and it's also that pedigree connection in another yeah. sense, Fran. Because and I, I think particularly this year, you know, you look at SEC school, big 12 schools, like, you know, the big 10 didn't play as much, but they still play. Like they wanted to get, go after guys that sort of, or schools, programs that played football in the fall. Cause they wanted tape on players. Yeah. Uh, but Michigan is, is a program that, as you pointed out, they're willing to go to that. Well, a couple of times they trust particularly Don Brown on the defensive side of the ball, but even Harbaugh on the offensive side of the ball, they trust the way those players are being coached because they, no, look, there's not enough time to coach him up. All of us in the media, we love the idea of the development of player. Look, he'll get some NFL coaching and he'll figure it out. You don't have time to do that. 
Nope. I guess there's some windows and OTAs and mini camp and training camp, but really you go to any sort of NFL training camp, the stuff they're installing on day one, that's getting ready for week one. Like they were ready working in game plan stuff. So coach him up. I is, is, is an affliction that people like me suffer from in the media, but it's more of a, a pipe dream than a reality. So you have to trust the coaching that they got at the college level. And that's why you see a lot of the new England picks. They're going for those pedigree type players. How do you feel? Last question for you here, Mark. When you, I, mean, I think I know where you're going to kind of go with this, but when you look at need best player available, how do you feel like they address that uh, in this class? When you, know, when you look at the group as a whole, I mean, I, I you probably know where I'm going with this. Like you said, in the first round, they looked. This is a team that likes where their roster is. They like what they did in the off season. They like the free agency additions, the two tight ends, Hunter Henry, John Smith, the additions at wide receiver. You know, Nelson Aguilar who took a big step forward with, with Gruden last year. You know, Kendrick Bourne is a nice type of player that they like. They can do some things with them schematically. You know, you can see they're going to carve out a 12 personnel, two tight end package, which. A lot of people brought up Gronkowski and Hernandez back what they were doing at the start of the 2010s, right? You know, they ability to go sort of flex 12 into 11 personnel, really use tempo, force the defense to make decisions to declare themselves. We're going to treat this as a base defense situation or a, a sub package situation. And then just make them wrong with whatever they do. They think they can win right now with the additions that they've made. But they also realize they had an opportunity here, pick at 15, to solve the quarterback position for 2022 and beyond. No, they don't want to be picking in the top half of the first round again. They realize that they can be competitive right now, and they think they can win with Cam with the talent they've put around him, but Cam's on a one-year deal. And if they do win, and if Cam does play better than he did last year, well, like, say, 2017 Cam, he might be gone. And so they had an opportunity to address the future at 15 with the Mac Jones pick. But then you really look at value. You know, the Barmore opportunity, maybe he was a first round player, slides to them at the top of the second round. They trade up to go get him. Perkins, a lot of people said he might be edge two, edge three, yep. maybe fringe first round play, player. They get him in the third round. Even Stevenson fills a need for them, the running back from Oklahoma, sort of, sort of that short yardage back, somebody they could trust you. Now, you know, I, I've told people before, First and goal from the four the past couple of years felt like first and goal from the minus 19. Like it just felt like it was a field goal situation. You weren't going to get the ball in the end zone. Stevenson gives them some power, some punches, a goal line, short yardage back that I think they missed. And so I think after the Jones pick where they really sort of went for need in future, they looked at value throughout the rest of the draft and tried to almost get best player available as they kept going along through days two and three. I feel like uh, Patriots fans might be getting a feel of like a, a LeGarrette Blunt or Stephen Ridley. Exactly. With, uh, with Stevenson exactly. Sure. Yeah. Particularly with Blunt, because like yeah. I said, they would get it to first and goal in the low end zone and it just low red zone. And it just felt like, look, this is hopeless. They, they couldn't find a way to convert in those scenarios, even back to the Brady 2019 season. It just felt like they couldn't figure it out down there. Now they've got somebody that maybe gives them a better chance to punch those situations in. Well, Mark, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, I think I will be taking you up on uh, some Absolutely, of that June man. content. Uh, come back. We'll talk some quarterbacks, but thanks so much for joining us here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. Fran, thanks so much for having me, man. I've had a blast. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the draft mailbag. All right, so great stuff there from Mark. Uh, you can follow on Twitter just like I do. And by the way, uh, the best way to throw us your support, I said it earlier, head on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Uh, leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. We got a couple here uh, that I wanted to hit on. Uh, write him. Left a five-star review saying, to anyone considering unsubscribing. Oh, this is great. To anyone considering unsubscribing from this podcast after the draft, don't do it. They not only go over all the Eagles picks, but will go division by division breakdowns of all the picks in the draft. Fran, I wanted to let you know that I compared your final mock draft with a rival podcast mock draft. And guess what? Your mock was more accurate. Both mocks had an even amount of exact picks, but you guys had more success predicting teams to the correct position. Congrats and just proves the level of information you're getting uh, on the podcast. Well, write him. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, you know, I think that to me, when I look at that mock draft episode before the, the draft, it's exactly what you mentioned. It's not necessarily all, you know, oh, how many picks do we get right? It's more like, let's get in the ballpark. Let's get an idea of what the thought process is with a lot of these teams. And I don't think we had too many surprises. You know, we talked about, um, you know, a lot of these teams, even in the back half, back half of the, the first round, 
It's like, all right, well, if you don't go this position, what positions are we talking about? And we kind of get a, an idea uh, of which ones make the most sense. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, there were only a couple picks that really took me off guard uh, once the first round was over. Uh, and I think that's a credit to that episode and to our uh, team of people that we rely on through all around the NFL, these writers that cover each of these teams so, so closely. So write him. Thanks so much uh, for the review. Let's get to one more here. Uh, Richard and Charleston left a five-star review saying, I was a bit surprised to hear that the Detroit Lions will put Penny Sewell at right tackle. Has he ever played that position? Uh, he may not be the most sam- seamless transition, in my opinion, uh, and he will be expected to start on day one. What are your thoughts? So, uh, Richard, it's a good question. And I think, look, we uh, Ben and I actually, ironically, did a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago over on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast channel about position switches in the NFL and you know what goes into that, those decisions, and what players have to go through and all, all those things. To me, when I look at, at Penny Sewell moving to right tackle, number one, no, he has never done it in a game. Uh, at least not to my knowledge. I don't even think going back to high school that he played right tackle. I think he was left side uh, all the way up coming through. One thing to remember, uh, number one, I mean, Jedrick Wills just did it for Cleveland, right? Had a great year. He was a right tackle for Alabama, made the move over to the, to the left side for the Cleveland Browns and, and didn't miss a beat, really, as far as I can tell, right? So that, I think that there's there's uh, an example of that happening and it, and still going off really well. Uh, I think Penny Sewell, the, the big thing, too, he had been cross-training at that position, not the same as doing it in a game, but been cross-training at that position. I think that him and his team, they knew that this was always a possibility. And he got drafted by a team. that Because even if he ended up in Cincinnati, Cincinnati has said from day one, yeah, they want Jonah Williams to be their left tackle. He's their left tackle. So uh, you know, if he went to Cincinnati, Penny Sewell was going to be on the right side. And so I think that this was always uh, in the cards for him. It was just a matter of really where he ended up. But um, no, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a huge issue, but... Each of these cases are individual, and we talked about that in that podcast with Ben over on the Eagle Eye in the Sky. Each of these guys uh, are going to be different. Some guys are okay going from left to right. Some guys struggle with that. Some guys would rather say, hey, move me to guard instead. You know, Let me play left guard instead of play right tackle. Like At least then I'm doing everything uh, same dominant hand, same dominant feet uh, that I'm used to, and the footwork uh, just has to change a little bit. Um, so each of these guys is different. My guess is that when Detroit talked with Penny Sewell in the lead up to the draft, they talked about this as a possibility, and he talked with his people uh, about that. And he, you know, uh, my guess is that he will be okay. I, he's got the skill set to do it. I mean, the guy is just a, a physical marvel. Uh, I'm very interested to see how it looks, but uh, I don't think that that's going to be a, an issue for him transitioning to the NFL. Let's just put it this way: if if Penny Sewell doesn't work out, I don't think it'll be because he played at right tackle. That's that's just my guess, but uh, we will see. We will see. He's a, a really really impressive player. One of my favorite players overall. Uh, in this draft class. So uh, great stuff there from Richard. Great stuff uh, from right him as well. Again, the best way to throw us your support, head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. We will be back later this week, hopefully, uh, on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. We've got our Journey episodes for you Eagles fans out there. We're going to dive through uh, all the times that we've broken down Devontae Smith over the course of the last couple of years here on the Journey of the Draft podcast. So uh, we'll be dropping that. If not this week, then it will will be next week, but coming up soon right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand. Download the official mobile app of the Philadelphia Eagles. Catch breaking news, see real-time stats, watch live or on-demand video clips, listen to Eagles podcasts, and so much more. Now you can stay in touch with the Eagles anytime, anywhere.